Heartbeat Herd. A former technician claims Planned Parenthood harvested parts from a baby delivered alive. Prayerful labor. Pope Francis teaches that prayer dignifies our work and ultimately the family. New digs. The U.S. ambassador to the Holy See takes us inside the relocated American embassy in Rome. And no ordinary top. This marble slab completes the altar on which Pope Francis will celebrate the Eucharist in the nation's capital. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, August 19th, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your News Now. A former medical technician reveals Planned Parenthood harvested organs from an aborted baby who was still alive at the time of the abortion. Wyatt Goolsby reports on this latest in a series of undercover videos. Brian, Planned Parenthood is working to counter the steady release of critical videos aimed at exposing abortion-related practices, but it'll be hard for them to defend themselves against this latest video released today, which describes a very graphic procedure. And she's like, okay, can you go the rest of the way? And I'm like, yes. And I didn't want to do this. It's hard for Holly O'Donnell to describe what she saw while working at a Planned Parenthood clinic. The former STEM Express technician says at no point did she feel comfortable with what her colleague told her to do, harvest the brain from an aborted baby whose heart was still beating. And she left and she's like, okay, you can clean it up. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there like, what did I just do? And that was the moment I knew I couldn't work for the company anymore. The video is the seventh in a series put out by the Center for Medical Progress. The goal is to uncover what Planned Parenthood clinics do with aborted fetal tissue. The videos have sparked a nationwide debate on government funding for the nation's largest abortion provider. If Congress does not have the courage to defund Planned Parenthood, I'll tell you what, a President Fiorina, when we go to zero-based budgeting, I simply will not provide the money to fund Planned Parenthood. Republican presidential candidates Jeb Bush and Rand Paul have also vowed to defund Planned Parenthood if they are elected. Five states, including Alabama, have at least partially cut funding. Formal investigations are underway in several other states. Planned Parenthood says the videos are part of a smear campaign. They claim the videos are politically motivated, heavily edited, and fail to show how tissue donations support life-saving research. Now, those arguments may not be enough to keep Planned Parenthood from losing more support. STEM Express, the company that provided some of those technicians, have already cut ties with the organization. Brian. Wyatt Goolsby, thank you. And joining us in studio, Jeannie Mancini, president of March for Life. First of all, Jeannie, your reaction to this latest video. Oh, it, it was terrible. And they all have been, sure. but I know it took me hours to recover after watching it today. And I, I, you know, suggested to my staff maybe that they not watch it because it was so hard. We're talking about brains and beating hearts and, and all sorts of just really graphic and horrific things. She talked about this difficult procedure. Mm. It sounds like murder to me. Yeah, no question. You have a baby who's alive. But because there have been so many of these, seven now, and I'm sure there will be more of these videos, is there a risk that we'll just get numb to this? Uh, absolutely. I, I think that there is that risk. Um, and literally this morning I thought that when I clicked on it and started thinking about, okay, I'm going to watch this. Am I going to be numb? I've watched so many of these. And then I was surprised. I think today's affected me the most. Maybe we should all say a prayer before we watch them because I think we should be deeply disturbed by what we're seeing. I mean, this is just the, such an inhumane treatment of, of human life. This is now coming into the public eye, but isn't this seedy foundation of Planned Parenthood hasn't been, it's been there all along. It has been there. The, the actual foundation of Planned Parenthood was very much tied to eugenics thought. Many of the founding directors were actively involved in the eugenics movement. Uh, Margaret Sanger herself was very pro-eugenics. Uh, she started this terrible project called the Negro Project and believed that certain people were imbeciles or just had a lesser kind of value as human beings. Um, later, Alan Guttmacher was also tied to eugenics. He was one of the presidents of Planned Parenthood. So this has gone on and on for many years into the 70s. So a recent report claims that half of Americans haven't seen these videos, which means the other half have. That's yeah. a lot of people. I thought it was good news. I mean, you know, I, I do want everyone to watch them. If they can, it's so hard to see it. But the fact that half of America has watched these, I think we're in a watershed moment in terms of the pro-life movement right now. And there's so much that Planned Parenthood 
um, has for us to discover and to talk about in terms of some of their finances and all sorts of different problems that I think it's, it's a wonderful thing that so many people have watched these and can talk about it. So you think this is really just the tip of the iceberg? I do. I do. I think it's a watershed moment, and I'm curious as to how God is going to use this. I know at the March for Life, we're praying daily about our piece in this puzzle um, to bring it into the light and how to bring a culture of life to the United States and end Planned Parenthood. Well, thank God for the March for Life. Jeannie Mancini, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. About a thousand people remain under mandatory evacuation near Chelan, Washington, where wildfires have ravaged the landscape. National Guard troops are helping dig fire lines as helicopters drop water. At least 95 fires are burning in the states of Washington and Idaho. In California, leaders there say they have enough resources to battle the blazes burning in California. Continued questions about her email server are shrugged off by Democratic presidential frontrunner Hillary Clinton. Did you try to wipe the entire, so that there'd be no email, no personal, no official, wipe the whole thing? Well, my personal emails are my personal business, right? So, I, so we went through a painstaking process and turned over 55,000 pages of anything we thought could be work-related. The former Secretary of State is under scrutiny for using her personal email server to conduct official State Department business. Only after months of legal wrangling was the server turned over to an FBI investigation. You said we, you were in charge of it. You were the official in charge. Did you wipe the server? What, like with a cloth or something? No. You know how it works digitally. Did you try to I, wipe the whole thing? I don't know how it works digitally at all. Uh, I do not so have you any... Didn't try. You did not try. Ed, I know you want to make a point, and I can just repeat what I have said. In order, to, in order to be as cooperative as possible, we have turned over the server. They can do whatever they want to with the server to figure out what's there or what's not there. Meanwhile, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders continues to draw strong crowds as he challenges Clinton for the Democratic nomination. It's very clear where Sanders stands on immigration. We have 11 million undocumented people in this country. In my view, we need to give them as soon as possible legal protection. I was in Phoenix last month, talked to a half a dozen young Hispanic kids, tears streaming from their eyes saying, we are worried that we can be deported, our moms can be deported tomorrow. So I think what we are about is keeping families together, not dividing them. Sanders' position on keeping families together echoes that of many U.S. Catholic bishops. A new poll, however, shows a different picture among the majority of voters, especially Republican voters. A new Rasmussen Reports national phone survey finds 70 percent of likely Republican voters favor building a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. 92 percent agree the United States should deport all illegal immigrants who have been convicted of a felony in this country. Among all likely voters, 51% favor building a wall, 80% support the deportation of an illegal immigrant who is a felon. Police in Thailand issue an arrest warrant for an unidentified foreign man connected with Monday's deadly Bangkok bombing. Authorities have not identified the man seen in this video leaving a backpack at a popular shrine. They are releasing a sketch and offering a reward. Police believe the man did not act alone, but is part of a network. Meanwhile, that Hindu shrine at the center of the bombing reopens to the public. Monks in orange robes chanting and praying for departed souls. 22 people died in the explosion. More than 100 were injured. Indonesia's search agency says flight data recorders from a crashed plane remain missing. Authorities backtracked after earlier saying both black boxes were recovered. The passenger plane crashed into a mountain over the weekend, killing all 54 people on board. Data from that missing recorder could provide valuable clues in the crash investigation. Germany's parliament overwhelmingly approves the latest Greece bailout plan. The $95 billion package is the third for Greece. That vote dispels speculations that German Chancellor Angela Merkel would have difficulty getting approval for the deal. If all goes according to plan, Greece receives the first cash installment tomorrow. Dozens of migrants are forced to return to Turkey after failing to reach Greece today. Their inflatable rafts couldn't make it across the Aegean Sea. Migrants say this crossing is the hardest thing to do. 
The pain we've been through in four years, there's no other example of it. If we didn't lose someone, like our friends and others, then the pain would only be physical. No one is happy to have to make this journey. Greece is now the forefront at Europe's escalating refugee crisis. The UN estimates 50,000 people reached Greek shores last month alone. Pope Francis warns unemployment causes enormous damage to society and to families. At today's general audience, he focused on the sacred role work provides families materially and spiritually. Preghiera e lavoro possono e devono stare insieme in armonia. The Holy Father saying prayer and work can and must go together in harmony. Francis frequently highlights the importance of dignified work. He says employers have a responsibility to their workers. Museum of the Bible teams up with the Israel Antiquities Authority to exhibit ancient artifacts from Israel here in Washington. A selection from the two million ancient artifacts in Israel's national treasures will be placed in a top floor gallery. The different periods referred to in the Bible and the Holy Land's rich history will be displayed. Museum of the Bible is set to open here in D.C. about two years from now. Coming up, is Canada getting closer to legalizing euthanasia nationwide? And our Alan Holdren continues his conversation with the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See. Work is sacred. Work gives dignity to a family. We must pray that work be not lacking in any family. Pope Francis today at his general audience. Thanks for joining us this Wednesday evening, August 19th. I'm Brian Patrick. California lawmakers will try again to pass assisted suicide legislation. An earlier attempt stalled after meeting with religious opposition. Los Angeles Archbishop Jose Gomez fears the measure endangers the lives of poor immigrant and minority communities. At least two dozen states have introduced assisted suicide legislation this year, but none of those bills have passed. The Ontario government creates an expert panel on euthanasia and assisted suicide for Canadian provinces and territories. The advisory group consists of longtime euthanasia promoters and is applauded by suicide lobby Dying with Dignity. Alex Shaddenberg is executive director of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, Skyping with us from Vancouver. Alex, how concerned are you about the formation of this panel? The Ontario government formed a panel which is a very pro-euthanasia panel. They have on it many of the leaders of the euthanasia lobby who are the, how would you say, the intellectual leaders. The one person is the wife of Dr. Donald Lowe, and when he died uh, last year, he put out a video explaining why we have to legalize euthanasia, as well as Jocelyn Downey, who's the leading pro-euthanasia person in Canada, is on this panel. This is a stacked panel, and they're going to try and give us a very wide, wide uh, euthanasia law, maybe similar to Belgium. Now, this panel is conducting a survey. What kinds of questions are being asked in the survey? The, the survey questions are really tilted. You know, it's, uh, it's very uh, terrible to see this because... Uh, you know, for instance, the questions will ask, you know, if someone is ex experiencing extreme suffering and nearing death, should they be allowed a death with dignity? The idea then is the only answer to someone who's experiencing pain and nearing death is a lethal injection, which is a foolish idea. So, you know, a lot of the people have been complaining about the fact that these questions is they're saying, you know, I've answered the questions, but there really weren't options to say I'm opposed, I'm opposed, I'm opposed, I'm opposed. So this is really a lobby, it seems like, for euthanasia. What influence do you think it'll have on the Canadian government? So I'm very concerned about this because the federal government set up a panel uh, in July, which was an excellent panel with great leaders on it. Like they have uh, our leading palliative care mind in Canada on it, a leading disability leader in Canada on it. So the federal government was trying to get a, a nice balanced approach to this question. And uh, the pr provincial governments are trying to steal the show from them and trying to impose this on us. So I'm very concerned because of the fact that the provincial governments might just go their own way. This idea of assisted suicide, is it widely accepted among the Canadian people or rejected? Well, the problem is that since the Supreme Court of Canada decision on February 6th, that was a, a wide decision. It was a terrible decision with very poor language in it, very, very wide language in it. Since that, a lot of people are sort of thinking of that it's inevitable. And with that sort of attitude, uh, those who would normally be against it or are concerned about it are now just sort of arguing, well, let's see what we can get. Well, the fact of it is, is giving the doctor the right to cause your death in law is never a good idea. Uh, doctors 
will use that right. People will die, and many will die even without request. Well, we know you and your people will not be giving up on this cause. Alex Shaddenberg, Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, joining us from Vancouver. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very, Tony. Thank you very much. And exactly one month from today, Pope Francis arrives in Havana before visiting the U.S. Alan Holdren talks one-on-one -on -one with the U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See about the Pope's decision to come here by way of Cuba. One of the, uh, the greatest international diplomatic developments of the last year uh, involved Vatican diplomacy. This is the normalization or this process of normalizing relations between the U.S. and Cuba. How have you been involved in this process? I have been very happily watching on the sidelines, cheering them on. Uh, it has been a major uh, breakthrough, something that many of us applauded, uh, even as President Obama mentioned changing the policy towards Cuba early on in his tenure. So uh, the, when the opportunity presented itself, the church became involved. Uh, I mean, you can only but applaud. The Pope will be visiting both of these nations next month. He'll actually be entering the United States from Cuba. What does that gesture, uh, what message is that sent to the world? Pope Francis said early on that if he did come to the United States, he would love to enter from the South. The choice of going to Cuba followed his choice of first going to Philadelphia for the World Meeting on Families. The next decision, was a response to President Obama's invitation to come to Washington. And thirdly, um, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's invitation to speak at the UN. And then along came the change in relationships uh, between the US and Cuba and uh, the invitation from Raul Castro to the Holy Father to come to Cuba. So it followed in a sequence. Significance. Oh, kind of, but uh, I wouldn't read a terrible amount into it, except in a positive way. And the Pope will be addressing the U.S. Congress while he's there in Washington, D.C. He's expected to speak on economic policy, on immigration and religious freedom. Uh, of, of all of these things, and in all of these things, do you expect him to grill the American people? No, I don't see uh, Francis grilling or calling out uh, congresspersons uh, on these issues. Rather, I think he, he will speak to Congress and to the American people and to the world through that venue about um, issues of, of fundamental concern, um, raising up the values that make our nation great, um, of compassion and concern for the poor, opportunity, liberties. Uh, I think he will raise all of those issues rather than scolding anybody. I don't think he's, he's prepared to do that. Um, there are a range of issues that he has already spoken on which are relevant uh, in the United States, and you mentioned some of the migration, the concern for the poor, uh, America's role in the world, and, and what it can be. So I think he'll raise many of those. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Up next, a major retailer decides not to differentiate between boys' and girls' toys. An exclusive look at the marble work for the Pope's altar. I'm Jason Calvi. I'll bring you inside, coming up next. It's Wednesday, which are traditionally devoted to St. Joseph, so tonight we ask for his intercession for our EWTN News Nightly family. St. Joseph, protector of families, pray for us. Thanks for joining us on this 19th of August. I'm Brian Patrick, and retail giant Target does away with labeling some items specifically for boys or for girls. In a recent statement, Target says, as guests have pointed out, suggesting products by gender is unnecessary. Our teams are working across the store to identify areas where we can phase out gender-based signage. Target specifically mentions removing signs from kids' bedding and toy aisles. Mary Rice Hassett is with us, a fellow at Ethics and Public Policy Center. Mary, what's the motive behind this? Is it customer complaints or a political agenda? Now, Target is clearly making this decision based on ideology, not on business principles. It's not good business to annoy your customers, and it's going to take moms twice as long as they go in and they're looking for toys. Now they've got to sort through not just 
uh, toddler toys and, and middle school toys, but things that are boys, girls, and it's all going to be jumbled together. That's, that's not good business practice. They say it's not going to apply to clothing, but you can see where we're going here. I mean, right, this is a, right. this gender neutral society idea. What are the risks of us going in this direction? Well, see, here's what's going on. Target has chosen sides. They filed a brief in the same-sex marriage case. So what this really is, is an application of a core belief of what Pope Francis calls gender ideology or gender theory. And that means saying that there is no such thing as sexual distinction or sexual difference in any meaningful way. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or girl, a man, woman, husband, wife, father, mother. So you can see how it fits into the same sex agenda. Problems are, one, it's not true. It's ironic because we're at a time when science is showing us just so many amazing things about how men's and women's bodies, our brains, our psychologies are so different. And yet ideology chooses to ignore that. But I think the big risk here, Brian, is that it's confusing to children and it's confusing to parents. Indeed it is. So when they talk about children's merchandise, are they targeting children? They are. They are, because children are the most malleable, and this is one way of just promoting the idea that we human beings can decide who we are and that our bodies are meaningless, we have no creator, and yet we know the truth, that God made us male and female, and so parents need to affirm that sexual difference and the importance of that, and they need to clear away the fog and help their children know and understand who they really are. And where else can we expect to see this stripping away of labels, if you will. Yeah, we're seeing it already in schools and where schools are doing away with different colored graduation gowns. They're not having uh, children line up by identifying as boys or girls. Why? Because they're, they're trying to pretend we're all the same. We're generic people. We're not generic people, Brian. And, and this, this is just ideology, nothing more. Yeah, it's a shame that equality is being confused with sameness. It's, right. not, it's not the same thing. Right. There is equality. But men and women are different, as Pope Francis says, for a reason. Right, for a reason. And that seems to be a pretty obvious reason. Right, right. From Ethics and Public Policy Center, Mary Rice Hassan, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, Pope Francis celebrates the first ever canonization on U.S. soil next month at a custom made altar. In part two of his exclusive report, Jason Calvi shows us the making of the altar's marvelous marble top. The story of the Pope's altar begins here in Virginia. Obviously, I've been to thousands of Masses, but, but to be at the Pope's Mass and to have had a hand in making something that he will touch is very, very meaningful. Pope Francis will celebrate Mass on the eight-foot-long slab, which will be placed on top of this wooden base. There are very few people who can say they've made something for him, and I'm one of those people. Julio Marquez and his colleagues are busy working on the marble top. It will become the main altar inside the National Shrine after the Pope's Mass. Here at Rugo, they have a library of stones. This is limestone from Alabama. And right here, this is from Botticino, Italy. And this is what the Pope's altar is going to be made of. I think the quarrying of this material goes back to the Middle Ages. Um, it's extremely popular in Catholic churches uh, throughout Italy. The same stone is used at the National Shrine. Rugo Stone is also working on a small slab of this Tennessee marble. It will go inside Knoxville's new cathedral. Pope Francis will bless it in New York. But first, this Argentine craftsman needs to cut it. He's one of the important person in the war. So it's, I don't know, I feel excited, you know. In Virginia, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Jason. I think we're all feeling a little excited. Until tomorrow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again on YouTube. For our EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick as we leave you from, uh, with some moments from today's audience with Pope Francis.